Hi, I'm Dr. Bob Carter. I'm Chief of Neurosurgery at Massachusetts General Hospital and Professor of Neurosurgery at Harvard Medical School. You are listening to Interview with the Surgeon with the Surgeon Agent. On this episode of Interview with the Surgeon, we welcome Dr. Bob Carter, Chair of Neurosurgery at Mass General and the William and Elizabeth Sweet Professor of Neurosurgery at Harvard Medical School. One of the nation's leading clinical neurosurgeons, Dr. Carter co-leads Massachusetts General Hospital's Brain Tumor Program, which brings together over 100 faculty and staff focused on brain tumor clinical care, research, and education. Dr. Carter is extensively published, and he lectures internationally on neurosurgery topics. He served as chair of the editorial board of the Journal of Neurosurgery and editorial advisory board member of neurosurgery. Elected to America's Top Doctors, Dr. Carter is a fellow of the American Association of Neurological Surgeons and a member of numerous medical organizations, including the Congress of Neurological Surgeons and the American Academy of Neurological surgery. He serves on the program committee for the American Stroke Association's International Stroke Conference and has served on the executive boards of the Joint Cerebral Vascular Section and the New England Neurosurgical Society. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon. Today, we welcome Dr. Bob Carter, Chair of Neurosurgery at Mass General. Doc, how are we doing today? We're doing well. Thank you for having me, Matthew. Thank you for being with us. So let's get this started. You know, what were your goals and aspirations during your residency? Yeah, uh, Great question. You know, one of the reasons I uh, chose to actually train here at Mass General was because it did fit along with my goals. I was, as a medical student, an MD and a PhD student, so that combination uh, was powerful to me of combining clinical practice, but also discovery and innovation, and trying to take uh, ideas that might come out of science, or even basic science or clinical science, and bring them back into the clinic. So the residency, uh, really, I had this twofold aspiration, become a great surgeon, but also be familiar with the ways of discovery, learn how to do science in a way that I could see in the future, I could bring that back into the, into the patient pool. Um, our program, for example, had a couple of years during which you could take uh, essentially research time. So I was here in Boston. I went over to MIT, uh, which is a great institution just across the river. And I studied in the laboratory of a, an individual who was a gene therapist, and it taught me a lot about how to bring those ideas into clinical practice in the future. And some of those have informed my, my ongoing science. So uh, one goal was really that, just combine a career of discovery and surgery. And it, it's, been, it's been powerful for me, and I've really enjoyed it. Now, taking us through your chief year, what was your mentality getting into your first job search process? And how that perspective changed the beginning years of your career? That's a, that's a very interesting question, actually. So in my, in my first job search process, you know, as I was coming up on the sixth year, and as you know, neurosurgical residency, seven years, uh, my wife and I talked about what were our goals for our family? What did we want to achieve? Uh, we had kids by then. Uh, we actually had four kids by then. And uh, we, were, we were busy with young family life. At the same time, I, I had trained in this great environment. So I was, I was somewhat fortunate in that in my sixth year, uh, my then chair of neurosurgery, uh, Dr. Nick Zervis, who is really an, an icon of neurosurgery, um, he invited me to consider a position for the following year to stay on staff. And so for me, I, I did stay on staff and was on the staff here for 10 years. But I will say, Matthew, that that experience sort of led me into my next job search 10 years later when after having been a faculty member at Mass General for 10 years, I had the notion that I wanted to become a chief or chair of a department of neurosurgery. And I began another search and the themes were the same. Uh, and I would categorize them in, in two major buckets. One is people, who, who are the people that I would be working with and what would those relationships look like? Would there be that mentorship? Would there be that trust between partners? Uh, would there be that environment which would allow me to explore do some new things, but also have the, you know, the careful watching of, of great partners. And then the second piece was um, in, in a job search, I think a little bit of patience is, is valuable. There's, there's not typically a perfect job uh, that you're just gonna be handed. You have to build it and craft it and develop it over time. And so I think sometimes that, that impatience for the per perfect job might actually um, slow a person down in the sense that they, they could make choices that wouldn't be consistent with their lifelong goals. So it was really family, the people that I'd be working with, and really the environment, uh, which was important to me. 
Now, when you're going through those thought processes regarding your career search, did you ever consider going private practice or are you academic focused all the way? I, I, I was a pretty strong academic focus uh, from, from day one. That being said, uh, when I began to look later at the chair jobs, there were different styles of chair jobs and some of them I would call private-demic, which would be a job where you really have a private practice style model, but there's a, an academic element to it. And then others would be more classically academic. And after I got into it and explored those, I really found that the academic jobs resonated with me more. But that being said, I really wanna point out, Matthew, I have the most tremendous respect for private practitioners in our field. It's a very demanding job. Um, when you're in private practice in neurosurgery, you're a frontline uh, person on call. There's uh, no buffer of residents or fellows. And you're really taking that call. You're making key, critical, life-changing decisions. And uh, you're doing it on, in long hours um, with a lot of stresses and challenges. So I admire uh, those folks that uh, take on private practice and do a great job with it. It wasn't the path that I chose, but it's a path that I, I greatly respect. At the same time, I've been really happy with the academic side because it has allowed me, and I'll just point out this anecdote, Matthew, uh, about 50% of all neurosurgery jobs are, have an academic focus. Uh, so many of them are affiliated with departments of neurosurgery, and there are over 100 departments. And so there are many academic jobs as well as private jobs. Um, one of the reasons the academic jobs uh, appealed to me was it allowed me to keep that investment that I'd made in learning how to be a scientist and a researcher. But also I found that the environment for care outside of my own two hands uh, was, was very, very important for certain types of complex cases. And what I mean by that is that uh, the ICU care, the nursing care that you will get at a tertiary or quaternary medical center allows you to just take it up one notch in complexity uh, from maybe a more community oriented hospital. And that, that transition uh, I think is, is something to think about in terms of where you practice, will you be able to do the things that you wanna do in the environment? You might have the same skill set whether you're in a smaller hospital or a larger academic hospital, but the latter will allow you to do some things that you might not otherwise be able to do because of the environment, the other team members and that kind of thing. And so that's another important piece of the academic puzzle in, in my opinion. Now you start off training at Mass General, you started your job at Mass General, you left. How'd you end up back at your home base as a chairman? Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Well, when I went uh, and looked at chair jobs and this was around 2010, uh, I saw a number of different places. One of the reasons UC San Diego, which is where I did select to become a chair and, and they were selecting me, uh, was it was a great environment that was very reminiscent of the places that I had trained as a medical student at Hopkins, uh, which again was quite a research oriented institution, the residency at Mass General. And then when I peeled back the covers and I saw at UC San Diego, what a tremendous group of people were there and a really tremendous environment. I thought to myself, this is where I can not only feel at home, but there's also some work to do. There are some really great opportunities here. And I, one of the, the great pleasures of my career has been in recruiting. I've really enjoyed getting to know people and seeing their career take off. And so for example, the current chair at UC San Diego, Alex Kalesi was somebody that I was able to recruit in my early years as chief there. Uh, one of the other faculty members, Dr. Clark Chen, who's now chair at Minnesota, was somebody that I was able to recruit there. So for me to be able to see individuals come in, experience their early career, uh, working with them as partners, and now to see them leading departments of neurosurgery is, is a, it's a big boost uh, to my own feeling about uh, professional accomplishment and ment mentorship. Now, throughout your journey, what would you say were some of the keys to your success that shaped your early career as you climbed the ranks of the academic world? Yeah, that's, that's another great question. Um, and uh, I think that the kind of things that I would think about in terms of how to translate all that great training into academic success uh, would be a couple of things. One, again, back to environment, really dive into a great environment and uh, choose based on partners and people first 
because that will allow you to develop what you want to be. Allow uh, finances, finances are important, but they should not, in my opinion, be the, the first notion of the first job. The first notion is really, again, that great environment because I think it takes about five years post-residency to really mature uh, surgically and to begin to hone, in, hone your craft in a way that then brings patients to you um, and you become someone that has that reputation of a high quality surgeon. So first and foremost, people environment, that was an important factor. Second, uh, I really like the idea of balancing professional and personal success, matching those two up. So for me, that's uh, on the personal side, you know, family is tremendously important. I've been lucky to have a very supportive uh, family. Uh, you need that, I think. But whether it's you know, someone you love or, or your friends that support you or whomever that might be, the people that you're gonna give to and then will give back to you, you need to invest in those relationships, even in your early career. There's a big temptation early on to say, oh, it's, I'm finally unleashed. I'm, I'm gonna do neurosurgery all the time. But there's a great value in continuing to invest in relationships throughout your career because those relationships will, will be the thing that sustains you in the hard times in, in future years. So balance, again, was another critical element to me. And with that balance comes pacing. And what I mean by pacing is a neurosurgical career, you've talked to experts in these surgical careers who've done a career over 30 years. What you'll gain as a sense from, I think each of them is the ability to, to see the long view, to, to pace out their career, to plan uh, not only for next year, but for 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, and really have a vision of who they want to be. Um, that, that pacing is, is important. You probably have heard, Matthew, that one of the great crisis, crises in medicine is, is burnout. And, and burnout comes from sprinting for the first five years, letting your relationships lapse, and then finding yourself not in a position to have a sustained contribution. So I think pacing, again, is really important. And then the last one that I would mention is, I, I think early success does depend on uh, taking at times calculated risks with your career investment. And what I mean by that is there might be an idea that you want to explore. Perhaps there's a discovery that was made in a laboratory that you're familiar with and you think it could have an application in neurosurgery. Maybe there's a neurosurgical technique that you think could have a chance of improving an outcome for patients that thought that you have is something to run with. Um, one of my, uh, one of the prior chairs here at Mass General uh, wrote a paper called The Difference Between Zero and One. And what he meant by that was there are times in your career where you'll see something and you'll have an insight and that insight could potentially translate into something big. If you don't act on it, it won't. But if you begin to develop it, take a calculated risk, invest a little bit of extra time in it, it could turn into something that would really transform your career. And I'll give you one example. Uh, a few years ago, I began to, uh, I've, I've long been interested in gene and cell therapy as a scientific uh, basis for innovation. But a few years ago, I became involved with a project to develop induced pluripotent stem cells and have those stem cells then be used in, in Parkinson's patients for uh, a, a cell, th cell therapy to restore dopamine circuits. For me, that was a new area, but I can actually say that now six years into the project and we've been able to publish some of this work in high profile journals and get funding for it. It's a very exciting element to, to my work. And so calculated risk, even as a young person is, is very valuable. I love that. Thank you for sharing that story with us. Now, as the chairman of the program, what advice do you have for the graduating chief residents and fellows entering the professional job market for the first time? Yeah, that's, you know, kind of consistent with the theme of what we've been talking about. Look for an opportunity where you will be able to flourish as to who you want to be. Um, you'll hear a lot of stories about how I did it. But remember, for you, there's only one story, and that's how you're going to do it. And so make sure that the environment that you choose is one that, that fits well with your personality, your short-term goals, your longer-term goals. Uh, don't neglect the other parts of life uh, when you make that, that decision. 
So think about, again, your family, impact on family. Um, I'll, I'll give you a little example here on this particular point. A few years ago, I was trying to recruit um, an individual here, great individual, had been alum of this program. Uh, I thought it was, it was a perfect professional opportunity for this person to come back after a few years of being on faculty elsewhere and take on a leadership role here. And uh, we had identified this person as, our, as an outstanding uh, individual. But when we got into the details of the conversation, it, I realized, and that individual realized, you know what, their family was in another city and there was an opportunity in that city that they could take. And it, it wasn't at the Mass General where they trained, but it was in an environment that very much fit with that individual's personal and family goals. And so uh, when uh, he told me that he wasn't gonna be able to come to Mass General, I actually not only understood, but appreciated the, the choice that, that that individual had made. So I guess the advice, Matthew, is really be true to yourself in terms of the, the types of opportunities that you look at and choose. Um, don't be afraid to you know, aggressively pursue those once you've identified those. It's okay to reach out to a chair and make a case for yourself. I think that's fine. Um, be willing to take on an opportunity that maybe isn't perfect because you're gonna have some time to invest in it. But as long as the framework is there, uh, I think you can be successful. Now in 2020, we've been dealing with this pandemic. So I'm curious what your advice is for the graduating class regarding their networking and outreaching process when they don't have the ability to meet folks like yourself at national conferences. It's a great question. You know, despite the fact that we're not doing those in-person handshakes anymore this year, and uh, I don't know exactly when those will resume, but what I would say is that the virtual handshake, whether it's by social media, Twitter, uh, outreach by email, uh, asking a question that is in a topical area that interests you, I welcome those. Uh, as chair, I do get a lot of inquiries. And at the same time, I know that I can't offer jobs to everybody that reaches out and that type of thing. But often um, I have connections that perhaps might help someone and I can refer them to another group that I know is looking or maybe that I think they could be a good fit. So I think it's okay to, to reach out and make those inquiries. I would also say that look for commonalities. So if you've got a research interest or you have a clinical interest and the, the world's expert in that domain happens to be uh, presenting or happens to be doing something, yeah, acknowledge the fact that you've, you've been interested in their work and that you're interested in learning more or perhaps developing a relationship. And again, I'll give you another example from personal experience. Uh, in my early career years, I. I started a very small blog, it doesn't exist anymore, but I, in that blog, I would comment on, on papers that I had found interesting to myself in the, in the literature. And I remember uh, getting an invitation to speak overseas at one of the large um, uh, Asian countries, uh, National Neurosurgical Societies. And I later asked the, the sponsor, you know, I'm, I'm relatively early in my career, how did you choose me to speak? And they said, oh, well, we, we saw your presence on the, on the blog and, and you commented on our paper and, and actually we really appreciated those comments. And so we wanted to have you come and speak and share your experience. So I think looking for ways to, to reach out, uh, doing research, investing in, in the relationships that you're trying to build is, is a very valuable thing to do. Now, speaking about conferences, what's been your involvement with the neurosurgery societies and the different journals? Great question. Um, I've, I've enjoyed the, my work with the journals. I've been on the editorial board of both neurosurgery and the journal of neurosurgery. And then just this past year completed the, the final term of my, my time on the journal of neurosurgery. The great thing about the journals is what you do in the journals is essentially capture that best work that people are bringing forth, whether it's clinical or basic science, you're really seeing the heart and soul of what people consider to be their professional uh, academic innovation and creativity. And it, it does come through in the papers. Um, it's For me, it's been a big plus. It's, it's a, quite a bit of work, actually. <laughs> if you talk to anybody that sat on these editorial boards, you'll, you'll hear and understand that there's quite a bit of effort to really bring together a good publication. I have a great admiration for our, you know, our editors in chief that uh, really run the, the op operations of these journals. The societies are very important in our field. 
as you know, we're a relatively small, somewhat guild-like community, just 5,000 members or so, both private and academic. And, you know, there are high schools that have 5,000 people in them. <laughs> so this is a small community. Uh, that being said, the societies, I think, really allow us to, um, over a period of years, as you participate in the societies, develop relationships. And also, they keep us grounded in our work. Uh, our work is complex. Uh, there's a risk element to neurosurgery. And we need to be up to date and sharing best practices with each other in order to achieve the best outcomes for our patients. And that, that's what happens in the societies. It's really that sharing of commonality of experience that, that's so valuable. Now there's a human element to being a neurosurgeon. What advice would you have given your younger self when dealing with complications or unideal situations in the OR? It's a great question. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I would say was a big learning experience for me is I spent all that, those years in residency, learning how to be a, what I felt was a technically very good surgeon and also developing this inquiry mindset uh, for discovering innovation. But it really took me additional years to learn how to teach neurosurgery. And when I say teach neurosurgery, that is to say, be able to mentor someone, watch them uh, work in the operating room and be able to essentially be a partner with them. And the reason I bring that up in the context of your question is I think when, uh, when things aren't going well in the operating room, there's a tendency to take away the teaching uh, by just doing it yourself or making sure. And what I have found over the years is to, the ability to uh, have the patience to work through step-by-step step and improve the skill set of the entire team, myself included, uh, going after the case and looking at the video with, again, the residents or team members that were with me, uh, talking to the other team members in the operating room about what was positive and what wasn't so positive in the operating room. Those things are, are very important for improvement, not only of myself, but of the entire team. And as I, as I mentioned before, I think we've all come to realize that the best outcomes for patients are when the whole team is pulling together, uh, not just the surgeon themselves. And so my advice to my younger self was uh, involve the team earlier, uh, involve the team in the, the conversations about how to do better, and uh, also have the humility to share with the team the things that you could have done better. And I think that that humility uh, is, is an important thing uh, along the way in terms of trying to improve our practice. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.